uh, walking along a plank that is 80 floors above the ground. And we do that with kids at, um, uh, at various different uh, events across Queensland, predominantly with the Queensland Museum and as part of World Science Festival, for example. And um, I mentioned already to you the Create Lab. Uh, if you want to go and find a little, a little bit more about my research and some of the work that I do in this space, um, then you can go to the Create Lab by Professor Tech. It is the it is www.createlab.com.au and find out a little bit more about what I do. But but that's really not why we're here, right? The reason why we're here is to talk a little bit about that relationship between uh, te technology enhanced learning and scholarly practice. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about scholarship. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about technology and why we should bother with technology. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how those two things connect together. And some of this stuff might be stuff that you guys have talked about before, and I suspect it it probably is, but really what I'm interested in here is is helping to sort of talk about those those relationships. Um, and I've done this before. I, I sort of often will talk to staff at my institution and at other institutions about scholarship and what we actually mean by scholarship, because I think it's something that can sometimes be a little bit fuzzy. In fact, I was having a conversation, I hope I'm not breaking any confidences by saying this, but I was having a conversation with our provost recently. And I said to the provost, uh, scholarship is just so much harder to measure than, than research. And she said, what, well, why do you say that, Michael? And I said, well, I mean, literally, if you look at our enterprise bargaining agreement or our academic profile document, there are, there are dollar numbers in there for how much research grant income you should get if you're an associate professor or a professor in various different disciplines, right? There are numbers in there that represent how many publications you should achieve, right? But we don't have anything like that for scholarship. Uh, we don't have anything for our teaching scholars. If they're interested in measuring their performance, we just don't have those metrics. And maybe other institutions do. And when we get to the discussion, I'd love to hear if you're working at Monash or, or RMIT, and then you've got some of those metrics, but we don't have those metrics because they're fuzzier. And so our academics find themselves sort of trying to trying to trying to understand what we actually mean when we talk about scholarship and how it's actually positioned and our academics are not the only ones right if we if we skip forward a little bit uh the national regulator has been thinking about this for a while right if you go back I think it's about six months or so um you'll find that Texas actually has a a guidance note uh for scholarship Right, they they they've got a sense of what scholarship is, um, but it's fairly broad, right? Really, when they talk about scholarship, what they're really interested in talking about is anything that involves uh, teaching and learning, and that can include some form of disciplinary scholarship. Um, and uh, you know what they want, what they're interested in is institutional encouragement and support for that scholarship across all areas of study. And they do measure this. I, I'm a TEXA expert, and for non-self-accrediting institutions, they make staff fill out this staff scholarly activity uh, document. And you have the, these institutions, these smaller institutions, submit one for every single staff member. Here's all the stuff that this staff member has done that we think is scholarship but it's, it's a massively broad definition and includes the disciplinary work that you do as well. And so I think it's a little fuzzy and I'd love to have a conversation when we get to talking about this, I'd love to unpack that a little bit at various institutions that you're at and how you guys think about scholarship. But I will say that one of the things that I think is really, uh, for me, that's really interesting when we talk about this is, is redefining what we're saying to really recognize that we're not interested so much in scholarship, but I think in, in many cases, what we're actually interested in is what somebody's focused in instead. And uh, when I was down at the University of New South Wales, they call, they call these staff uh, education focused staff, which I know is also a term that they often use at UQ and various other institutions. And, and I, I guess that balances with discipline focused staff, right? And the idea is that we all do the same kind of work, uh, but it's just what we're focused on that's a little bit different. Are we focused on education or are we focused on the discipline work that we do? And I think that's a more useful definition, which of course flies directly in the face of, uh, <laughs> of what Tex is talking about, um, but, uh, but gives you a bit of an idea. But something that I've found useful 
over the years when I talk about scholarship is this analogy, um, which I was surprised when I first shared it um, because a lot of people sort of said, um, oh, I've never heard that before. And I thought it was actually something that was, was pretty, um, pretty common, right? Which is that if you imagine what we do as academics like a three-legged stool, um, then what we're doing as academics is 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 often um, is is often broken into those categories, and those legs can be different lengths. And you've probably heard those categories before. At most institutions, the most popular categories, are, the way they're usually defined, are teaching, research, and service. Right? And sometimes we call service engagement. Uh, sometimes sometimes you can see I stuck them over here. Right? Sometimes leadership is mixed in there somehow. Right? But generally speaking, talk to any academic across the world, talk to an American academic, a UK academic, they'll say, oh, an academic career is broken into teaching, research and service. 40-40-20, right, is the, is the common model. Um, and depending on your profile, those things change, right? If you're, a, if you're education focused, if you're a teaching scholar, depending on your institution, then the teaching leg of the stool might be longer. If you're a research professor, then the, the research leg of the stool might be, might be longer. And if you're the deputy dean or something like that of a particular institution or the dean or whatever at PVC, then the service leg might be a little bit longer, right? And the length of those legs sometimes changes throughout your career. You move from being more researchy to a little bit more teaching focused. Emilio was telling me that that's a change that he's made, right? Um, but we've got this stool with these three legs and all of the legs are a slightly different length. And uh, I told this analogy to my wife recently and she said, Michael, that's a stupid analogy because the stool would never stand up straight. And uh, she's probably right. My, my wife is probably right when she says things like that, but uh, hopefully it's useful for us to think about. And the reason I often use it as an analogy, especially when I'm talking about scholarship, is um, because I think that there is value in arguing that on top of that stool, Regardless of the length of those three legs, we have a seat for our stool and that seat for our stool represents our scholarship. And in line with Texas definition, regardless of whether you are somebody that is more focused on teaching or you're more focused on research or you're more focused on service. So a teaching scholar or a research scholar or a service scholar, I think there's an argument to be made that we should all be scholarly in some way. And I said to one of my colleagues this once, I said, oh, you know, that there was an argument from some of our researchers at the uni that they didn't, oh, I don't do scholarship. I'm a researcher, I don't do scholarship. I do big R research, right? And I said this to one of my colleagues and he said, but shouldn't they be scholars? Shouldn't we all be scholars? Aren't we all interested in knowledge and, and building knowledge and disseminating knowledge? Isn't that what we do, regardless of whether that's in a classroom or in a research focus, or if you're a, uh, if you're a dean or a deputy dean, maybe it's in, in, in that leadership component and that service component that you're working in. And so my argument is that we should have scholarship for everybody. Right, scholarship should be central to our academic practice, regardless of whether we're a teacher or a researcher or a service scholar. And actually wrote about this, if you Google uh, so scholarship is central to academic practice, I wrote a little piece about this in the Campus Morning Mail. And then we don't have the Campus Morning Mail anymore, it's now called Future Campus, but the, all the articles are still available. And I'm pretty sure if you follow this link, you will either get to the front page of Future Campus and you can search for it, um, or I'm, I'm maybe even deep link directly to the article. I'm not sure what Stephen's actually done. Um, so you can find out a little bit more about that, but that's my argument, right? That, that scholarship is ill-defined. There's my attempt at sort of helping us to sort of build some walls around these ideas of scholarship and what I mean when I actually talk about scholarship. And I do things like this at my university. I practice what I pe preach in computer science. We call it dog fooding, right? Eating, eating your own dog food, doing, doing the thing that you are, you are preaching. And so I do things like the technology enhanced learning community of practice at my university and the technology enhanced learning community of practice is about best practice in the area of technology enhanced learning, because I think that that gives us an opportunity to build better scholars in this particular space. Uh, and if you're interested, I included the link here for you because um, all of the, t the Telcop episodes are available on YouTube. So if you want to go back and watch that, you can. And in particular, this one here 
from August was was a corker. Uh, it was with uh, Lisa Twitchett from who was the account manager from Turnitin talking about breast practice with artificial intelligence and generative AI using Turnitin, which of course is a topic that everybody's all, all pretty excited about at the moment. So that's my first argument. That's, that's sort of us, that's me trying to build some walls around scholarship for you. What I understand is scholarship. And when we get to having our discussion, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about, uh, about how your various institutions define scholarship. I saw uh, James in the chat talking about what they have at, at La Trobe uh, with sort of their teaching focused staff. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what's happening at various other institutions. But the other thing I probably need to do before we start, we kind of move on to the, the way these two things interact is make an argument for why we should bother with technology. And, and that's, I mean, I, it's funny that I have to make this argument because we all sit here and we use technology every day, right? And I, I mean, I'm Professor Tech, right? Of course, I'm going to argue that we should be using technology, but we all use technology every day. We sit there on our phones, we, we dial in via Zoom, all of those kinds of things. We're all massively excited with the ability to use technology. And yet, and yet there is a segment of the population that makes an argument that technology shouldn't be used uh, by children, for example, uh, or shouldn't be used in the classroom. We should all go back to, you know, the good old fashioned tweed jacket with the leather patches on the arms and the chalk and the chalkboard and all of those kinds of things, right? Um, and so I, I, I feel a need sometimes to make the argument that we should bother with technology, that it is important. I think that technology becomes a part of what we do. And of course, in the context that I'm talking to you, this argument is that technology should be important to what we do in terms of our uh, classroom practice, in terms of what we do in you know, for our education as, as education focused staff. And it's a pretty easy argument to make really. I've actually only got a couple of slides to make the argument for you that technology is useful. Uh, the first one is this one here from a report um, by the World Economic Forum. This is getting a little bit old, but it really hasn't changed that technology is a really big part of the future of work. Uh, people often quote a survey by Oxford University from, I think it's getting a little bit old now. I think it's like 2003 or something like that. It's a few years ago, maybe, maybe not that old, but maybe at least 10 years old, that quoted that up to 50% of jobs were at medium risk of disappearing in the next years or decades and everybody uh, or some people often ask me about that survey and say were they true is that true is that really true that all of these jobs might go away to which the answer is yes it is right they, these jobs are disappearing jobs like a cashier or payroll clerk or whatever it might be might be disappearing very likely to be, be disappearing as technology comes in now People are quick, quick to argue that the net amount of jobs that we have is not going to change, right? There are going to be still jobs out there that, that just the profile of jobs are going to change. And of course, the way that the profile of the jobs is going to change is that we, uh, the people that are learning now, all of our students at the primary school and high school are going to be more focused on technology and technology skills. And so if we look at this future of jobs report, we can see very clearly uh, that they recommend that these students need all of those things you'd expect, like uh, reading and writing and things like that. But then on the bottom of the list, ICT literacy, uh, which we currently call uh, at uh, Australian primary schools and high schools, we currently call it digital literacy. We've previously called it ICT general capabilities. This idea that students, when they graduate high school, regardless of where you are in Australia, um, have to have a certain level of sort of base computer knowledge. But we can actually break that down, right? When we talk about uh, students having digital literacy, right? We're talking about them being able to use Word and Excel and PowerPoint and Teams and Zoom and all of those kinds of things. But we're also often talking about them having other skills that are specific to technology, that are skills that you build with technology, but that are, that are not necessarily, you know, using Word or, or learning how to program in Python or working with a robot or whatever it might be, but instead those ICT generic skills like uh, complex problem solving, uh, judgment and decision making, systems analysis, things like algorithmic 
thinking, uh, user experience, design, functional decomposition, all of these are skills that you build up as a technology professional or by working with technology that are not necessarily technology skills. And actually, I don't know if anyone here is from the University of Sydney, but the University of Sydney did some work in this a while ago. The Australian Computer Academy uh, did some work in this space and I think did some uh, did a really good breakdown of these kinds of skills that are not necessarily about Python and coding and robotics and things like that, but are more about the skills that you learn by working with technology that will be useful in the future of work and the future of jobs. And the ACA is now part of Grok Academy. Um, and I think those resources are still available. Um, so that's the first argument, right, is that is that kids these kids these days, as they move forward, are going to have to learn how to use technology. The second argument is that technology is making a massive difference on our lives. And it's really interesting because I've been sharing this picture for, I want to say, 10 years right, the Gartner uh, Emerging Technology Hype Cycle. And the Emerging Technology Hype Cycle uh, maps out how technology is going to move into our lives more and more uh, through this through this, uh, this 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 line graph, right? And I love the titles on this line graph. They, you know, they, they argue that for any particular piece of technology, once that technology starts, it, it will begin by becoming a really big part of our lives to the point where we all think that it's gonna change everything, right? It's gonna, it's gonna change everybody's lives in every possible way. And they call that the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, it's then gonna drop down into a trough of disillusionment where we realize that the technology is not a solve all for everything, or it's not gonna totally screw with our lives. Uh, and then finally work out what the technology is actually good for, for and we enter the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. I used to show this figure for mixed reality, which I do a lot of work in, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, which was down here. It's now disappeared entirely off the graph because Gartner has decided that in 2021, we've probably fallen into the trough of disillusionment and maybe starting to get to the slope of enlightenment with extended reality, but you will see that some technologies that you might recognize, like for example, generative AI is on this graph right now as an example of something that uh, only just started very much heading towards that peak of inflated expectations, but we're likely at some point to get to a point where it's gonna fall into our trough of disillusionment. And I think we're seeing that, right? It's interesting. I was talking about generative AI earlier in this year and it was panic stations, right? Everybody was worried about generative AI. It's gonna change the way higher education works. We're gonna to have to rewrite all of our assessment. Panic, 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 panic. Um, and I think we're still doing a little bit of that now. Um, but I also think we're starting to move beyond that a little bit and starting to say, well, okay, rather than panic, what are we actually going to do with generative AI in terms of incorporating it into our classroom practice in a responsible way? Uh, and so I think Gen AI is, is starting to get up towards the top of this peak of inflated expectations and maybe just maybe dropping down over to the other side. Um, but technology is a big part of our lives. It very much is uh, going to change what we do every day. And whilst we could certainly move back to saying we're going to have chalkboards and we're going to have tweed jackets and all of our students are going to come into our lecture theatres and listen to our classes face to face and we're not going to have any Zooms, we're not going to have any Moodle sites or anything like that. The reality is that that's going to be pretty difficult in a world where technology is an important part of what they need to do in their future and technology is very much an important part of our society as a whole. And of course, beyond that, our students are pushing back pretty hard as well. I don't know what it's like at your institution, but my institution, having now proven that we don't have to run lectures face to face, is finding it very difficult to drag students back to the lecture theatres because the students are pushing back and saying, well, why can't I do it on Zoom? Why do I need to come back? And, and, and so it's, um, it's, it's something that we need, to, we need to be comfortable with, we need to accept. And I feel like, again, I, I mean, maybe, I'm making that argument to a whole set of people that are like, of course, Michael, of course, technology is, is, is part of our lives. But I do often find myself uh, in various different forums talking to people who say, well, why don't we just ban 
the technology entirely? Why don't we just take it out of the classrooms? Why do we? Why don't we just stop the students from using it? Wouldn't that be the simplest way? And of course, the argument there is, well, yeah, we could, but does that really make sense if technology is such a big part of our lives going into the future? And so that kind of leads us, so we talked about scholarship. And we've talked a little bit about technology and, and in particular how technology should fit into our classroom experience and hopefully I've made an argument for why that should work. And so then that gives me an opportunity now to uh, share with you a model that you might have seen me talking about before, uh, which is the pedagogy before technology model. And I've been preaching this for years and years. And uh, as I said to you, I've only fairly recently realised that really this, this is a model for technology enhanced learning and scholarship and what we do in our classroom practice. And when I first started talking about PBT, pedagogy before technology, uh, I didn't realise that that was the case because I'm just so invested in what I do as a teaching scholar that I didn't really think about it. Um, but when you actually look at it and you think through it, you go, okay, I can see that really what you're preaching here is, is, is good scholarly practice with technology by talking about how technology is going to be integrated in your classroom. You're very much preaching that great tech, that great practice in, in, in scholarly teaching and scholarly learning. And so the model is really easy. And again, if you've seen me talk, you probably you might have seen this model before. Uh, it's only three steps, right? Number one, when you're looking at a, um, a classroom, when you're looking at a particular unit and you're interested in thinking about how to make that unit better, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. We could be talking about nursing, we could be talking about paramedics, we could be talking about engineering, we could be talking about digital media, it doesn't really matter. You need to start with the pedagogy. You need to start by looking at that unit and saying, well, first and foremost, what is the problem? What is the problem that my students are having? The pedagogical problem that my students are having, not the technology problem that my students are having. And if you reflect on the unit that you're teaching and think about what you're actually doing with your particular unit, usually we know, right? I used to teach database design and all of my students struggled with normalization. And I know that they struggle with normalization. I know that, that, that they struggle to work out how to actually do that. I currently teach a unit called IT and society. And I know that my students struggle to articulate the ethical theories in writing, right? They write down and actually argue for ethical theories by writing things down. And so I know those are the problems with my classroom. And I know those are the sticking points. And that's the first thing that the PBT model asks you to do is think about those particular problems. Once you've done that, you then think about how you can solve the problem. And importantly, at this point, you don't think about the technology. At this point, you just think about how you can solve the problem if you had a magic wand, if you could do anything that you wanted. We did some work with paramedic science years and years ago, and I, I made this argument to somebody in paramedic science. I said, I said, what's the problem? And she said, well, the problem is that the students don't have the opportunity to do the paramedic skills before the res school. And I said to her, well, how would you solve that problem? And she said, I'd send them all the paramedics dummy, but they're too expensive. But that would be the way that I would solve the problem. And so there's no technology involved. At Seeky University, we had somebody do this in Badal. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, the problem is that we just don't have enough people with feet that people need to work on. And uh, we need more feet. And I said, how would you solve that problem? And she said, get more feet, right? We need feet and we need feet that have bunions and corns and all of those things. And that would be the way that we would solve that problem. And so we think about what the problem is, and then we think about how we can solve the problem. And only then, only then, do we think about how technology can help. And this is when you call me, right? Or you talk to a learning designer or a, a instructional technologist or whatever it is, educational technologist at your institution, whatever it is that your particular institution calls them. And you say, how do I do this? How do I do this? And in case of our paramedics, it meant they are sending out an app that the students could use and some 3D printed tools that they could use wherever they were in order to practice paramedic science skills. In the case of our podiatry people, uh, it involved 3D printing a foot 
they 3D printed a whole bunch of feet and then they used a, a moldable sort of 3D printing plastic and, and, and uh, uh, you know, um, clay and stuff like that to make the bunions and the corns that the students needed to work on. And so she ended up with a, her box full of feet that she could actually use. Um, and in both cases, it's the technology is not important, right? What's important is that we've used the technology to solve a pedagogical problem with our particular class. And, uh, and so I often use this model to talk through things. And I do find myself often talking to scholars about this model because inevitably somebody comes to me and says, I wanna teach the nurses more effectively. I wanna teach the doctors more effectively. I wanna teach the paramedics more effectively or the engineers more effectively. Uh, and those things are often called in, in the literature, they're often called blah, blah, blah education nursing education, digital media education, engineering education, right? So if somebody's working in that space, they'll often come to me and I'll often say, well, try PBT. Of course, PBT doesn't solve the whole, the whole problem. And one of the things you really need to be able to do is boil things down to that small problem. And I often find that people struggle with that a little bit, boiling it down to those sticking points, those tricky things that you actually want to solve in your classroom. And then sometimes you'll also find that the technology is not the answer. And that's fine if the technology is not the answer, because again, it's not about using technology, it's about solving a problem. So if you're an engineer that can solve a problem using bricks, using blocks, right, to teach students how to build structures, then do that, right? If you can solve a problem by wearing a costume to the classroom, and there's an educator at CQU that's quite famous for that, um, then do that, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be a technology solution. But often, often I find that in pursuit of good, scholarly practice and in and in being a good teaching scholar that technology is a great way to actually attack these things and so uh here's the here's the textual summary of of the pedagogy before technology model so if you're not a fan of the figure there's the, there's the text start with the problem in the classroom then think about ways to solve that problem and only then work out how technology can help. If you want the citation, if I go back a slide, you'll see that the citation for the article that I read about PBT in is down the bottom of the slide there. So that leads us pretty neatly to talking about um, how tell and scholarship are connected together. And hopefully I've kind of already made a case for you right, that these two things are connected together. And now again, I'm not arguing that you, you have to be involved in technology enhanced learning in order to be scholarly. I don't think you do. I think there are some great examples of people being very scholarly that doesn't involve technology enhanced learning at all. But I think the reality also is that a lot of people that are beginning their journey in scholarship, in the scholarship of learning and teaching, really often will like to do something that's a little bit more applied, right? And I used to be the chair of the awards committee and the chair of the uh, grants committee at CQ University. And I definitely found that with our emerging scholars, that were true. They're giving them an idea of something that, that actually involved in intervention or a change in their classroom. Uh, if you're a researcher, you know, something action research based or design based research based was often a really good way for us to uh, to get them thinking about their scholarly practice and moving into this scholarship of teaching and learning space. Um, and so if you buy from me that, um, that tell and scholarship should be connected together in some way, um, then I can maybe give you a few little tips on, um, on how those things might get connected together. And I'm gonna tell you up, up front that I stole all of this stuff shamelessly from this piece here that we wrote for the Journal of University Teaching and Learning Practice or JUTL for short, uh, which talks specifically about the ed tech difference, talks specifically about digitalization, digital pedagogy, and then this field of technology enhanced learning. I'm the first author on the piece, as you can see, but I, there are a whole bunch of other people, all of the associate editors of the educational technology section for Juddle that helped to write that piece. And so it is very much a, a collaborative piece that we wrote. But the idea of this piece was very much that whenever we wrote it, I think it was 18 months ago now, believe it or not, 18 months ago when we wrote this piece, 
the idea was that we wanted to give some advice to people that were writing articles for the journal about educational technology on what they might be interested in doing to make those articles more scholarly, right? Because inevitably, I mean, even though I pitched that pedagogy should become before technology, right? That the PB, P, P should become before the T, right? You will often find people that are very focused on the technology. They're very focused on, on just telling us about the cool technology thing that they did in their classroom. And whilst that's great, the reality is that if you're writing something for a journal, you probably need to be a little bit more scholarly in what you do. And so we wrote this piece and we sort of said, okay, let's think a little bit about what it is that we want people to focus on when they're talking about uh, educational technology and they're trying to write a paper for our journal. And this was actually an editorial piece that we often point people towards these days to say, okay, look, focus on these particular areas. And when I had the opportunity to do this for Emilio and we kind of, kind of came up with that really long title, <laughs> um, I looked back at this article and I went, you know what? This is really basically just a list of how technology enhanced learning and scholarship of learning and teaching connect together, right? Because ultimately in, in encouraging people that were focused on educational technology to write something that's suited for our, our journal, we were essentially encouraging them to be more scholarly. We were connecting together tell and scholarly practice. And so what did we say? We said that there are four things that you should focus on when you're thinking about trying to make an educational technology article more scholarly. The first one, I thought they were gonna go one by one then. <laughs> the first one is theoretical framing. You should have some theoretical framework for your work. Uh, and I mean, again, this is, this is pretty standard good research practice, right? If you're going to make a change, in your classroom, you need some basis for why you made that change. And if you're one of my colleagues in the School of Engineer Education, you, you, you might conjure up a theorist. You might say a Piagetian work or Vygotskyan work or whatever it might be, right? And you could do that, right? But even if you don't do that, you know, basing what you're doing on some sort of theory, some sort of person that's done some work in this space before is, is always useful rather than just sort of saying, okay, I'm going to dive into the classroom and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make this change. And somebody says, why are you going to make this change? And you go, you go, well, I don't know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? If you can base it in some theory, if you can make an argument for, for why this is a good idea, then that really helps your scholarly argument. Because we're talking about working in a journal, we said to people, you need some methodological rigor, right? You need some mechanism to say, well, this is what I actually did when I, uh, when I attacked this problem. And I used some, some research method to do it. And that research method is, is entirely up to you. And in fact, people will often do program evaluations of some sort, right? And that's something you can do if you want to. So at the end of it, uh, you, you, you finish and you sort of say, how did you like that? Did you enjoy that? Was that something that was useful for you in terms of engagement or in terms of motivation or maybe in terms of your learning? Right, and that's one way that you can do things. It's a really common way to do things. But you just need to be really careful because ultimately these things are often just uh, affected by the novelty effect. People enjoyed doing it because it was VR or because it was, you know, different, right? And so there's a novelty effect involved there. Uh, and sometimes they don't really give you good results if you don't focus specifically on what it is that you're actually trying to change in engagement or motivation or learning outcomes or whatever it is. Uh, recently retired, uh, I think now emeritus professor, Peter Goodyear from the University of Sydney uh, used to call them happy sheets or at one point I think called them happy sheets. It's so funny because I, I think I then saw Peter some years later and said, you called them happy sheets. And he said, I did. I, I it clearly stuck in my brain if it, if it didn't stick in Peter's. Um, but this idea that you're just asking them, are you happy? And, and often the answer you'll get back is, yes, I'm happy. Right. Uh, and so you can do that and, and Judd will, you know, we'll, 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 we'll look at things like that. We'll let you do program evaluation as long as there's a little bit of methodology behind it, but thinking a little bit more about the methodological rigor 
of what you're doing is really important. It's, you know, what am I trying to evaluate? What research questions am I trying to answer? And how am I going to answer those research questions? And I mentioned it before, but um, there's a couple of really common methodologies. Action research is a very common methodology in our space. Um, and design-based research is a really common methodology in our space as well. Now, you don't have to do those. There's lots of other choices that you can make, but I find that scholars, um, are often interested in those things again because they're often interested in doing sort of more applied sort of work and so action research suits them really well. Um, number three is uh, is the inclusion of people. Make sure you include people in what you're doing and uh, that in involves including people in writing your paper um, and this is often when you're we're putting together your team. Is there somebody from education that can help you with the theoretical framing is the researcher that can help you with the methodology that's really good at quant or qual or whatever it is that you're doing? Is there an educational technologist like me that can help you with the intervention, right? So include those people, but also include the people in what you're doing in terms of your analysis, your data analysis and your data collection as well. Because unfortunately, the reality is that if you move into this space, you are moving into social science. And for uh, some sciencey types out there, that can be a little bit confronting, right? Uh, your, your, your work is often much more involved in talking to people, in interviewing people, in surveying people, in understanding how things are affecting people's heads, what's going on in their mind in terms of engagement and motivation and all of those other kinds of things. And so you inevitably find yourself needing to include people. I don't think I've seen a single ed, te ed tech paper go past the journal, and I'm the senior editor for educational technology that doesn't involve people in some way. And then the last one's easy. Uh, the technology needs to serve a purpose. Um, and uh, you guess guess which of the editors put that one in in the list, right? Um, it, it's it's really important that the technology serves a purpose. That the technology is not that's just there for technology's sake. That the technology is actually solving that problem that I talked about before. And of course, the best thing is if that sol technology is solving a pedagogy problem. I, I used to make the argument pretty strongly that if we're introducing technology into our classroom to solve a problem with time or a problem with money um, or a problem for convenience, um, then they're probably not things that we, we really want to be reporting on. I, I don't find them particularly scholarly. Now, I've softened over the years because I think it's difficult often to come up with, a, with, with every intervention being really focused on the pedagogy and changing the, the practice for better educational outcomes. And sometimes inevitably you can make an argument that saving time makes it more accessible, more equitable, more inclusive. And those are all important things that we think about in the academy. But it, I think it's definitely true that, the, but still true that the best type of technology to introduce is technology that solves that pedagogy problem. And our, um, our podiatry people that I was talking about a little bit before, I remember having that conversation with them early in the piece and saying them saying to me initially, um, I, I want to 3D print feet because, you know, we just don't have enough feet. And I'm sa and me saying, well, is not having enough feet enough, right? If that paper gets out, if you eventually publish that, is somebody eventually going to say to you, well, I don't have trouble with the amount of feet. I, d I don't have, we've got plenty of feet around here, right? And so, uh, so, so talking about that or talking about the fact that you're in a remote community or talking about the fact that it's more efficient in terms of time or in terms of money for you to do something different, I, I think is a, is a little bit of a dangerous road to walk down. And I was very excited when, uh, when they came back to me, the, the podiatry guys came back to me. We had a couple of day workshop and I remember really clearly talking to them um, about this one day, them going home and going to sleep and then coming to me the next morning and saying, I've got it, Michael. And the thing that they got was that, um, that they wanted to make feet that had problems and issues that they couldn't commonly find out there in the big wide world right and again you know you could argue that with enough feet you'll find all of those issues but it just felt like a much more pedag pedagogically rigorous reason for them to 3d print their feet as opposed to a reason related to time or related to money 
And so that's uh, that's the article that we wrote, and it hopefully helps to tie some of those ideas together, helps you to understand, even in the educational technology space, why we might be interested in this stuff. Um, and hopefully, if you're somebody that's more scholarly, you might start to think about how educational technology might be useful in what you're doing, because ultimately, this produces better ed ed tech outputs, but also, I think, produces better scholarly practice as well. Um, we're almost there. Um, I'm just having a look at my watch thinking, how are we going for time? Um, let me do this one just really, really quickly. This has got nothing to do with what we're talking about, um, but is just an opportunity for me to give a little plug to some of the work that we're currently doing now. I've been talking for years about, uh, about helping kids in particular to understand technology in various different ways, um, whether that's digital safety, whether that's digital literacy, whether that's uh, digital well-being, digital habits, digital self-control. We can define it in all sorts of different ways. You saw right at the very beginning that this is something that even when we're talking about work, which is quite narrow, we, we, we think about. But of course, what I'm more interested in is that holistic understanding of technology because I'm interested in removing that fear of technology. And so for the last couple of years, we've been working in this space. We call it broadly the digital empowerment space. And in the digital empowerment space, we've been thinking a little bit about how we can help students to understand and be more safe online and to uh, have better habits online and, and better digital well-being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just to prove that I've been talking about it for years, here's an article that I wrote about I, the iCube generation a few years ago with a colleague of mine, James Burt. Um, and you can find that one if you like. Um, but And there's, actually, there's the link down the bottom. But more importantly, what I want to mention is that Australia is thinking about this a little bit as well. Recently, uh, the eSafety Commissioner here in Australia has started to do some work in this space as of January 2022. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that we've actually secured some funding from the eSafety Commissioner to do some work in this space as well, to start thinking about what it is that makes kids safe online. And so if you want to do a little bit of a Google search, you're going to start finding some papers that I've, I've started to talk about some of these ideas for. And this is the beginning of one of the ones that we published. I published this with Joe Orlando from Western Sydney University and Kwon Yui Sim, who is from uh, Sydney Institute of uh, Science and uh, Science, Commerce and Sydney, Sydney International School of Technology and Commerce, uh, but formerly from uh, AUT, Auckland University of Technology, which was much easier to remember. Um, and uh, this is some work that we started to do in, in identifying what kids found was safe and unsafe in what they did every day at school. And this is in particular focused on, on uh, kids from the ages of 10 to 13. Uh, but in, in, in particular, the bits that I wanna highlight is the fact that these students uh, that we talked to that were transitioning from primary school to high school, whilst they found things like creativity and problem solving good in their school experience, the things that they really, really worried about were those things that I mentioned, things like self-control. Things like uh, talking to other students online, uh, things like quality content identification and building relationships online as well comes out a lot. And so I think there's still a lot of work that we need to do. And again, this is really not related to what we're talking about, but I wanted to highlight it because I think as we move into university and as you guys are thinking about your scholarly practice and what you're doing with students, there's value in having that little, uh, that slightly more holistic view and thinking about how can I introduce technology in a way that helps my students' well-being, that helps my students' uh, digital habits, uh, because we've also done this work with higher education students. And although these traffic lights are a little different, uh, the reality is that these uh, similar things end up in this really red zone. Um, and similar things add up in this really green zone, even for higher education students as well. So thinking about those things might be useful for you, but we've only just started publishing this. If you Google it, you'll find a few beginning publications from me and Joe and Kwong Yui, uh, but there'll be certainly more of this stuff coming out soon. 
So hopefully I've inspired you. Hopefully I've got you starting to think about what you might do in your classroom practice, how you might weave together your technology enhanced learning and what you're doing with technology with your scholarly practice. And I've started you thinking about how those things might connect together, the, the scholarly activity and the technology enhanced learning and why they might be useful. Hopefully I've also inspired you with the pedagogy before technology model. And I noticed somebody mentioned it in the chat, which is really exciting. If PBT is something that you're interested in and you do end up doing work with PBT, or even if you just want to talk to me a little bit more, feel free to touch base with me and, uh, and, and we can have a conversation. And I definitely have lots of conversations with people as the, as the educational technologist in the room, right? And that is certainly something that I'm happy to do. If you've got an idea, you know what you want to do, but you're not quite sure how to do it, you know, touch base with me and let me know. And you can do that via Twitter if you want to, although I'm not often on Twitter slash X anymore, but there's my, my, my X handle if you want to use it. You can do that on Facebook. Probably the place that I spend most of my time these days is LinkedIn, so you can follow me on LinkedIn. Or if you're feeling really, really old fashioned, you can, uh, I'm an XX, that's correct, William. I am an XXer. As well, yes, X is now my X, I think is what I've heard some people say. Um, uh, but yeah, definitely LinkedIn is, uh, is, is where I spend a lot of my time. Or if you're really old fashioned, you can go uh, and follow me via email, uh, send me an email as well, m.cowling at cpu.edu.au. Uh, if you want to know more about the stuff that I do with the kids, if you've got kids yourself and you'd love to uh, come along and sit them in VR with Professor Tech, then feel free. To come and see me. I do World Science Festival pretty much across Queensland. Uh, there are like six or seven World Science Festivals across Queensland, so feel free to come and visit with me. Um, uh, so there's me at World Science Festival or follow me on LinkedIn. I often go other places as well. Uh, and if you want to have a chat to me about the workshops that we do, then I'm happy to do that too. Professor Tech's Intro to Awesome is the one that we do with the kids. Um, and then uh, weaving technology into the fabric of the classroom is the one that we do with high school teachers. Uh, but we can also talk to you a little bit about what you might do in a higher education classroom as well. Say you're in central learning and teaching and want to do some work with your teachers at your university. But apart from that, that's pretty much where we get to. There are the two key links for you, uh, createlab.com.au, which I mentioned to you already. Or if you want links to everything, go to michaelacowling.com. And that'll point you in the direction of all of the other stuff, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the Create Lab, everything that you might be interested in. So that's probably the one to write down if you want to write down one of them. Apart from that, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Emilio again, and uh, I'm looking forward to having a bit of a discussion with you all.